to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim the news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. The Apostle Paul, with great love for his own countrymen, says, I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my own countrymen in the flesh. What in the world is Paul talking about? Well, as we study the message of Romans, the gospel being God's power to save, Paul here with a heartfelt plea to the Israelites wants them to see that without Christ, there's no hope. And for way too long, you've rejected God. Friend, we welcome you today to our third installment in our study of the book of Romans. The message of the Romans, uh, of the book of Romans is such a powerful message of salvation in Christ Jesus. And we hope today that you'll have your Bible handy. If you don't have your Bible, we want to encourage you to get, take just a moment and locate it as we're going to open up the Word of God and study from God's divine will in the book of Romans today. As always, we want you to know that members of the Lord's Church, Churches of Christ in your area, have brought these lessons to you today in hopes that each of us will grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The Lord's Church in your area would love for you to stop by one of their assemblies uh, on Sunday or Wednesday. They'd be happy for you to attend worship with them. And if you've got questions about God, about the Bible, about the church, or, or the greatest question of all, what must I do to be saved? Friend, they'd be happy to sit down and study the Word of God with you. You'll find loving people in the Lord's church and every congregation who want to help others go to heaven. Friend, here at the Gospel of Christ, we also are concerned about souls. We want you to spend eternity with Almighty God. We want to help you in any way that we can in your study of God's will. Please visit our website, thegospelofchrist.com. We've got a lot of good Bible study material there. We have videos of all our lessons as well as audio. We have a lot of good written material. Also, if you'd like to have a copy of this series on the book of Romans or any Old Testament or New Testament book and a lot of topical studies, you can visit our website, fill out a media request form. We'd be happy to send that to you free of charge. Friend, as we move into thinking about the great message of salvation and how that faith accesses that grace of God and, and the power of faith and, and how Israel had rejected God for so long. Now in chapters 9 through 12 in our study today, Paul is going to identify the main problems Israel had in putting their faith in God. And we're going to make practical application to that along the way as well. But friend, rest assured, although the Holy Spirit, the Apostle Paul, will say some very difficult things by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he wants you to know from the outset, his love for Israel is true and sure. Look in Romans chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, and you see the heart of Paul and why he says these things. I tell you the truth in Christ, I'm not lying. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself, Paul says, I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, for my countrymen, according to the flesh. Paul was a... Uh, an Israelite. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews, he'll go on to say, of the tribe of Benjamin, of the great stock of Israel, trained in all the ways of Gamaliel. And yet Paul will say to so many of the people that were like him, caught up in tradition, caught up in the uh, commandments of some of the teachers of that day, Paul will show them clearly that it's the gospel that's God's way to save. But friend, let's make a practical application to this idea of the gospel being God's power to save. Anytime somebody rejects God, rejects the gospel, and rejects Jesus Christ, that's the saddest thing there could ever be. 
because there's no hope without Christ. There's no way of salvation without Jesus. John 14, 6. You know, Jesus felt this way about Israel as well. He went into Jerusalem and as he's uh, uh, about to go in and ultimately die for the, all the world, Jesus looks out across Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, he said. How I wish I could gather you together as a, chick gathers her, uh, as a chicken gathers her chicks under his, her wings. But you're not willing. He felt great sorrow for them. Jeremiah wept over the nation of Israel in the book of Jeremiah. John, when he saw the, the, the great unfolding of God's wrath, was brought to tears in the book of Revelation for all the multitudes of people, many of them pagans, who were going to be lost. And friend, when we think about people outside of Christ, when we think about those who are living in sin and won't obey the gospel, it brings great grief and sorrow to our heart. Ultimately today, we want you to know this. We want you to know that the God of heaven loves you deeply. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, Cast all your cares upon Him. He cares for you. And as you listen to the messages today that we bring, please understand as well, our motivation in doing this is because we want men and women to go to heaven. That was Paul's motivation. That's the Holy Spirit's motivation. And that's Christian's motivation today as well. In fact, in Romans 9, verse 4, Paul in chapter 9, verses 3 and 4, Paul somehow wishes that if at all possible he could take their, their lostness, their unsaved nature upon himself, and that somehow they would all be saved. That's what he wants for his own countrymen. I wish I could be a curse for Christ, for my own countrymen, for Israelites in the flesh. Now, Paul doesn't want to be lost, but he wants them to see how important this is and how much there is a need for them to be saved. And then in Romans chapter 10, as we move forward in our study of uh, Israel's rejection of God, Paul is going to move from rejection of God to sanctification through Jesus Christ. Like the Apostle Paul, our prayer should be for all men to be saved. Look in Romans chapter 10, and I want you to notice as he continues this idea, look in Romans 10 verse 1. Paul says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. Christians everywhere are praying that men and women will obey the gospel and be saved. Why is that? Because we've been lost before. We understand what that means and we've also obeyed the gospel and we know how good that is. But mainly, that's God's desire. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 2, 4, God wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. What's the nature of God like? God wants everybody to be saved. What do you mean everybody to be saved? God doesn't want anyone to be lost. 2 Peter 3 verse 9. Jesus said in Luke 19 10, the scripture says that Jesus came to seek and save the lost. And Jesus tasted death for every man. And so Paul says, my heart's desire and prayer is that all Israel may be saved. And friend, that's what we want for men and women as well. But as you think about this idea, Men and women have to come to the realization, as did the Israelites, that it's possible to be sincere, it's possible to be committed to, and it's possible to be doing religious things. It's possible to be sincere, but to be sincerely wrong in what you're doing. I want you to notice what Paul says in Romans 10 verse 2. The scripture records this. Of the Israelites, Paul says, For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. Friend, there's, a, there's lots of good people who are concerned about religious things, who may even try to live according to some of the moral teachings of the Bible. But maybe they're caught up in religions that aren't pleasing to God. Maybe they're caught up in denominationalism. Maybe they've been taught ways of salvation that are not according to the Bible. Maybe man's tradition, like with the Israelites, maybe man's tradition is a big basis for what they're doing. Catholicism is a big part of that. And so many people are caught up in what the Pope or the Fathers or what the history of the Catholic Church says. My friend, just like with Judaism, please understand it's possible to be sincere and to be sincerely wrong. These are the type of people that Paul is trying to reach out to 
with the gospel. And friend, we want men and women to know today that it's not enough just to be committed to religious ideas or committed to tradition or some man's teaching. We've got to go to the Bible and make sure that what we're doing is based on the Word of God and a pure desire and motive to glorify and honor God in our lives. Now, as Paul writes to some of these Israelites who he hopes will be saved, he's going to say something very important in Romans 10 verse 4. And this is such a, a, a big point as it relates to the old law. Paul is going to so clearly say to these Jews, let me tell you about that law. The end, the fulfillment of that law is Christ. Christ is the end result of everything the law was pointing to. Look at Romans chapter 10, and I want you to notice what he says in verse number 4. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Do you remember we mentioned in our previous lesson, Galatians 3, 15 through 24, that, that Christ was the uh, a tutor or a school, the old law was a tutor or a schoolmaster bringing us to Christ? But when faith has come, there's no longer a need for the law or the schoolmaster. Well, friend, that law pointed men and women to Jesus. But when Christ comes, we don't need that tutor or schoolmaster anymore. It, the partial is gone. The complete is here. When the writer says in Romans 10 verse 4, Christ is the end of the law, He's more the, the completion or the fulfillment. Not one jot or one tittle of all the law shall be done away with until it's all fulfilled. Well, it was all fulfilled in Jesus Christ. He's the completion of the Old Testament law. It's not as though, and some people had this idea in the first century. You've just come to, when you preach Christ, you've come to tear down, destroy, and in essence, take a sledgehammer to the old law. No, it's more beautiful and picturesque than that. The old law was a good, perfect law with a perfect purpose. Christ is the end of that law. He's the fulfillment of it. It did its job by getting you up to that point, teaching you what sin was, and bringing Christ into the world. Once He's here, you no longer need that guide or that schoolmaster anymore. And so when we think about Christ, friend, one of the things that the writer will clearly say is, you've got to put your faith in Him now. You've got to believe and orally put your trust in Jesus Christ. Notice he says that in Romans 10 verses 9 and 10. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Paul clearly teaches that that, that faith in Christ is essential. If you believe, if you're committed to that, you confess the Lord Jesus Christ you're on the road to being saved as well. Now, friend, that's not everything the Bible teaches one has to do to be saved, but it's essential to have faith in Jesus and to confess Him with your mouth. Now, there's no doubt. Jesus also said, unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Luke 13, verse 3. Uh, unless you're born again, you cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Unless you're born of water and the Spirit, you can't get in God's kingdom. John 3, verses 3 through 5. And so we're going to put everything. We don't want to pick and choose here and there. We want to put everything together on it. But friend, the overarching idea here is this. You've got to keep it in the context. To these Jewish people who have rejected God for so long, Paul wants them to see Christ is the end of the law. The gospel is is God's salvation today, and it's the obedience of faith. If you have faith in Jesus and you're willing to do what He says, that's how you'll be saved today. Then in Romans chapter 10, Paul goes on further to show how you get that faith. Paul discusses a lot about faith, and someone says, okay, I understand faith is based on evidence. Romans 1 verse 20, it's based on substance. Hebrews 11 verse 1, but where am I going to look? for that evidence and that substance to, to have faith. How do I get to the point where I'm willing to trust God no matter what? Well, friend, that's why God gave us the Holy Bible. That's why God gave us His undefiled, pure Word. Listen carefully. Faith comes by the Word of God. How do we know that? Look at this premier blockbuster passage about faith 
in Romans 10, 17. That faith that saves, here's how you get it. Notice the very simple words of Romans chapter 10, verse 17. So then, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. How do I get faith? I've got to hear. What do you mean hear? Do I just hear whatever I want to hear? Just whoever's speaking about God or whatever I decide or whatever I like or some preacher stands up and preaches uh, and claims he got a message about God. Is that how I get faith? No. Listen to it again. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing what? Hearing by the Word of God. Friend, as I read, as I study, as I uh, devour, as I'm nourished by the Word of God, and as I grow in my knowledge of God and His Word, you know what also grows? My faith, my trust. When I see that God cannot lie, and He's never done it, Hebrews 6.18, that God can always be trusted, that what God says is always going to come true, that God is good and loving and kind, that He will deal with man according to His law, and that if we obey Jesus Christ, we will be saved. When I read and study, the more I read, the more I study, and the more I stay in the Word, my faith continually begins to grow. How do you get faith that saves? Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Friend, we cannot overemphasize the importance of personal Bible study. I'm not talking about somebody doing it for you. I'm not talking about somebody telling you what they think you need to do. The greatest, one of the greatest things we have today is that we have unfettered access to the Word of God. If that's the case, and faith causes me, the Word of God causes me to get faith, I need to be reading my Bible for myself. Study. That's what the Bible says. Study to show yourself approved unto God. 2 Timothy 2 verse 15. Search the Scriptures daily. Acts 17 verse 11. Give attention to reading. 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse number 12. And then Paul moves in chapter 11 to the, some of the reasoning behind why these men and women need the gospel need to quit rejecting God, need to put their faith in Jesus who saves. And friend, much of it has to do with the fact that there is both goodness and there's severity to God. God wants to save all men. That's His main aim. That's why He sent His Son into the world. He wants everybody to be saved. Friend, let's realize also that those who don't, those who aren't saved, they will have to suffer the wrath of God. Now, friend, the Bible clearly teaches Israelites are now thinking, well, God, you've just thrown us to the side. And God says, no, I've never cast away my people. I always did what I could to save them and always did what I could to spare a remnant if they would trust. Look in Romans chapter 11 and notice what the Scripture says in verse 1. Paul says, I say then, has God cast away His people? Did God just throw Israel away? Certainly not. Paul says, for I'm an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away His people whom He foreknew. And so he goes on to show that, you know, it, it, Paul says, look, I've been saved in Jesus. It, you, nobody's been cast away. Nobody's been thrown aside. But you've got to have faith. It's not by the old law. It's not by the traditions of, of the Jews or the Pharisees or the uh, Sadducees. If you'll trust God, if you'll put your faith in Him, He'll save you. Hebrews 13 verse 5 clearly teaches us, The Lord will never leave us nor forsake us, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. The Bible teaches in Proverbs 3 verse number 5. Now friend, also realize this though. God doesn't want to cast anybody aside. God's not throwing them away like a, you know, a piece of paper that's no good anymore. But also realize God's not going to force anybody to do what's right. And God's not going to force anybody to stop believing error. If men and women, God will allow people who do not want to or do not put forth the effort to find truth. God allows people to be blinded by error in the sense that He doesn't come down and immediately stop that. And so there's a warning in there. Notice Romans chapter 11 verses 7 and 8. What then? Israel has not obtained what it seeks, but the elect have obtained it, and the rest were blinded, just as it is written. 
God has given them a spirit of stupor, eyes that they should not see, ears that they should not hear to this very day. And the writer is saying, well, well God, um, is it the case that Israel's just blinded and that's your fault? No, it's not God's fault. God didn't want them to be blinded. God didn't want them to get caught up in tradition. God didn't want them to come so focused on law keeping that they missed the point of it. That was their own doing. And God will allow people, if they don't look for the truth, if they're content with error, if, if tradition soothes their conscience, God allows people to continue in error. But that's not what God wants. And friend, that's not what anybody wants. God wants men and women to be saved. But there's a, a very important warning here, and it's that you've got to make sure, men and women have got to make sure that what they're doing is according to the will of God. God is not going to come down and miraculously whisper in your ear, you're in error, get out of it. Well, friend, you've got to have the desire to study the Bible, look for truth, and make sure that what we're doing is based on faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ, which saves men and women. And as we mentioned, that's so true because there is both a goodness and a severity to God. Look in Romans chapter 11, and I want you to notice what the Scripture says in verse number 33. The Bible says this in Romans chapter 11, verse number 22 and 23, and verse 33. Therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God on those who fail, those who wouldn't accept true severity, but toward you, goodness, if you continue in His goodness, otherwise you will be cut off. And then verse 33. Oh, the depth and the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and His ways past finding out. You know, we can know God and we can know the truth. We can't know everything there is about God because there are secret things God's not revealed. Deuteronomy 29, 29. But we know there's goodness and we know there's severity. God's balanced. He wants men and women to be saved, but He's not going to force anybody. But He makes that way available. And I have a personal we have a personal responsibility by faith, which comes through the Word of God, to seek and to search and to prove that what we're doing is based on the truth of God's will. Then in chapter 12, Paul is now going to move into the practical section of the book of Romans where he's going to encourage these Christians to greater faithfulness. And so here are some of the practical lessons that are mentioned beginning in chapter 12. Paul says, for you Christians who are trying to live by the gospel, please realize your bodies have got to be a living sacrifice to God every day. Paul says, I beg you, Romans 12 verse 1, I beg you by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And then he'll go on to say, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. How does the Christian live by faith in Jesus Christ every day? By realizing it's not about the exterior body and what I can give it or what I can feed it or how much pleasure it can obtain. My body now is a living sacrifice to God. When I obeyed the gospel and when you obeyed the gospel, we gave it all to God, did we not? 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 through 20. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are His. I was bought at a price. So were you. Therefore, with our body, we need to do what we can to glorify and honor God. Paul will go on to teach these Christians that as part of living everyday life, it's not about then about getting even. It's not about getting, about getting mad and getting even. Instead, as Christians, we want to do good to all men, right? Notice some of the practical lessons of Romans 12, verse number 17. The Bible says, Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. You know, we, sometimes people live under the mindset that you don't get mad, you get even. No, it's not the way a Christian lives. I don't repay evil for evil. Meaning if somebody comes over and punches me, I'm going to punch them back. Somebody cuts me off in traffic, I don't punch it to get ahead of them and cut them off. I don't, I don't live on the mentality of don't get mad, get even. Repay no one evil for evil. Do your part 
to live at peace with all men. Look in Romans 12, verse number 18. As much, if it's possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Now, there are times when people, peace is a two-way street. Sometimes people won't let it happen, but I'm going to do my part. As much as it depends on me, hey, I'm going to be a peacemaker. I'm going to be a peace bringer, mainly when we try to teach others the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then he makes this kind of closing idea, some of these practical thoughts in verse number 21. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Don't let evil win. Rather, you beat evil with good. By doing good, by living according to the gospel every day, by being a good example in our communities, by spreading the light of Jesus Christ, by walking in His footsteps. How do you defeat evil? By doing good. You don't defeat evil by getting a bigger hammer of evil and beating it up. That's not the way it works. You defeat evil with good. The more good I can do, the more I can be transformed in the image of Christ, the more I can talk and act and walk and live as Jesus lived, the more we're defeating evil every minute. How wonderful that is for the child of God. And so, friend, we want to encourage you again about the power of the gospel. Remember the overall theme of the book of Romans is the gospel is God's power to save. How do you defeat evil? By obeying the gospel and living according to it each and every day. Friend, we ask you today, have you obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ? The great day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, Peter stood up and preached that message. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Romans 10 verse 17. They believed in Jesus with all their heart. Romans 10 verses 9 and 10. They were willing to acknowledge Him as the Savior of the world and the Son of God. Acts 2 verse 36 and 37. Romans 10 verse 10. And they were willing to repent. Peter told them. In Acts 2 verse 38, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. Those who gladly received His word were saved and God added them to His church. Friend, have you accessed the power of the gospel by obedience to Jesus Christ? If not, we're begging you today, don't reject God any longer. Let Him into your life by obeying the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our prayer is that you will do just that. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your walk. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. Or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905. Or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.